why that is. And just to be concrete and to be able to focus on something, we'll start by looking at the universe at a temperature of around 10 to the, or below 10 to the 9 Kelvin. And the reason I'm choosing this is because then we know right away what the, the content of the universe is, because this is after E plus, E minus uh, annihilation. So let's say after. And so this means that uh, the contents of the universe are, so we have the, the photons that we're interested in, then we have the electrons that are left over because of uh, an asymmetry between matter and antimatter, protons, then from uh, nuclear synthesis, as we discussed, there are some, some helium uh, nuclei, there are some deuterons, and then we also know that there's neutrinos and dark matter in the universe, we haven't yet discussed exactly why that is, but so we'll, uh, we know that uh, this is roughly what the universe consists of at that time. And uh, this part is uh, interacting through the electromagnetic magnetic interactions and efficiently exchanges energy, momentum. And so this, is, this part is usually called the baryon photon plasma. And uh, the relevant interactions that are uh, going on in that medium are the, the Coulomb interactions on the one hand. So we have Coulomb interactions where electrons scatter off protons. And then uh, obviously they also scatter off whatever nuclei are there. and so on, so the various charged particles interact with each other through the Coulomb interactions. In addition, for the, the photons, the interactions the photons interact with, uh, in, uh, take part in uh, is Compton scattering. Uh, Compton scattering, so we have processes where uh, electrons or photons scatter off the electrons in the plasma. Then uh, we have additional processes, let's call them uh, double Compton scattering. And so here, the electron or the photon scatters off an electron, but an additional photon is emitted. And then finally, we also have additional processes that are usually referred to as Bremsstrahlung. And here we just have processes where, let's say, an electron scatters off a proton, and in the process, an additional photon is emitted. And at early times, so at the temperature of 10 to the 9 Kelvin or so, all these processes occur rapidly by which I mean that their rates are much bigger than the expansion rate of the universe so the the particles scatter every time on a time scale in which the universe changes in size many many scattering processes occur and so through the uh, Coulomb interactions, the, the ions are uh, exchanging energy and momentum very efficiently through the Compton scattering. The, the photons exchange energy with the, with the electrons very efficiently. And so um, the energies are efficiently redistributed in the, in the photon spectrum. And in addition, through the double Compton scattering and Bremsstrahlung, we can create and destroy photons also very efficiently. 
And so this implies if you can redistribute the, uh, the energies efficiently, create and destroy photons efficiently, you know that the, photons, uh, the photon spectrum is a black body spectrum. which I'll write as uh, n as a function of nu, the frequency or the energy of the photon as a, as a function of time is just 8 pi, the 8 or the 2 here is because you have two uh, spin states or helicity states, e to the h nu over kt, where this depends on, uh, on the temper at the time uh, minus one. So we have certainly in the early universe when all these processes are efficient, the, the photons, the, the spectrum is a black body spectrum. And the question that we'll try to understand now is uh, why or to what extent, uh, at what level of precision do we expect the, the spectrum at the present still to be a, a black body spectrum? And in the beginning, we'll focus on just why in a uh, somewhat crude approximation, and then we'll eventually work uh, toward this direction, which is, I mean, so there are some small departures from it that are predicted by the theory. Those are called spectral distortions, and we'll discuss them at the end. But for now, let's uh, study it in a simple way and try to mostly answer why we expect it to be a black body spectrum uh, today. And uh, we'll do this in a very crude approximation for now. So for now, we'll consider a very simplified picture. And then we'll understand how to do better than that. So in this crude approximation, what we'll assume is that the photons remain in thermal equilibrium all the way until last scattering. And we'll also assume that last scattering occurs instantaneously, so all the photons last scatter at the same time. It's obviously not quite true. We'll see how to do better than that. But for now, let's make that assumption. So we'll assume that it's instantaneous. And then we'll assume that the photons just free stream. From the last scattering surface to us. And one last assumption we'll make is that there's no energy or photons injected into the medium. And none of these are really uh, true, but we'll be able to, to do better as we go along. But it's a good zeroth order description of the process. So the, the photons are essentially in thermal equilibrium until last scattering, and from then on, they just free stream to the present. And so now we'll try to understand uh, 
why in this picture we expect a, a black body spectrum. Does that make sense? And then we'll systematically do better. Okay, so by assumption, here we're saying the photons remain in equilibrium until last scattering. So at last scattering, we still have a black body spectrum. So we have that the, the spectrum as a function of uh, new at last scattering is still uh, d nu, 8 pi nu squared d nu over e to the h nu over k, the temperature at last scattering, minus 1. And so now the, the photons free stream And for this, to understand what the spectrum is at while the, the photons free stream, we'll use some of the effects that we calculated in the last lecture. So what we'll need is if we want to know the spectrum uh, as a function of frequency at some time t after last scattering, then uh, we know a number of things. So one of the things we know is that the number density of photons redshifts, like the scale factor cubed. So we will have a fact of power A last scattering over A cubed. And then we also know that if we see the photon today with a frequency nu at last scattering, this photon had a higher energy because the energy redshifted as a function of time. So we know that it has to be the spectrum at the time of uh, last scattering, but at a frequency that was higher by this ratio of scale factors. So there's an A over a last scattering times nu, and then also the frequency interval. So uh, this is d nu, which I keep forgetting, and then there's a d of a over a last scattering of nu. So this is what the spectrum at a later time is. If at last scattering it's given by this and the photons just free stream, so there's this factor from just the expansion of the universe that dilutes the number density of photons. And then there is this, uh, this factor because the, the energies of the photons redshift. And so if you plug it in, you see that you have this uh, to the third power. And then here you have the inverse of that squared. And then from this piece, you have another one. So all the, uh, these pieces cancel. So this is still 8 pi nu squared d nu. And then the only place something interesting happens is here. So this is h, and then we're plugging in this, a nu k t last scattering, a last scattering minus 1. And I can still squeeze it in here. So this is, well, let's put it on the next one. So this, if we just continue, this is 8 pi nu squared d nu, and then over e to the h nu over kt as a function of t minus 1, where t as a function of t after last scattering is just t last scattering, the scale factor at the time of last scattering divided by the scale factor at the time of, of interest. And so we see that the, the temperature of, so the, the free streaming preserves the black body spectrum. And the, the temperature redshifts. So this is relatively easy in, uh, in this approximation. And then uh, so far, we've been assuming that uh, last scattering is instantaneous. This assumption we wouldn't have to make if around the time of last scattering, the spectrum 
already frozen. So if around the time of last scattering, photons no longer efficiently exchange energy with the, with the electrons, and that turns out to be the case. So we'll estimate these in a, in a second. But so some of these we can give up very easily. So if the energy is no longer redistributed around last scattering, it doesn't matter if last scattering is instantaneous or not. And so this is actually uh, what's happening here, but we'll see that in more detail. So does, does that all make sense so far? Okay, so then um, before we continue and improve on our calculation, let's look a little bit at the, at the measurements that, that people did. And I thought I'd start with the, the title page of the, the proposal just to give you an idea of the, the time scales that were involved. So obviously as soon as the CMB uh, was uh, detected, it was clear to people that with a single frequency you can't really convincingly argue that it's a black body spectrum, so you need to have additional measurements. This is a proposal from 1974 for the COBE satellite. Uh, so this is, you see, uh, Mather, Weiss, Wilkinson, Hauser. Uh, so this uh, cosmic background radiation satellite, this became COBE. And the measurements from COBE, you've probably seen in, in one form or another. They made it onto T-shirts. They've been in, in various places. So this uh, took until the, the 90s. So this is from 1990. And it's a very uh, nice measurement of the, uh, a black body spectrum. In fact, it's the most precise measurement of a black body spectrum. And people these days think they can, by just repeating this with modern technology, could do, be doing, a, a, let's say, four orders of magnitude better, uh, even though the uh, uncertainty will we'll explain a little bit why that's interesting, what you could actually learn by, by doing that. But this is the, the measurement from COBE FIRAS. So there were different instruments on the, the COBE satellite this is the FIRAS instrument that was led by Mather and is the, the experiment that measured the black body spectrum and the temperature of the cosmic microwave background. What's less known is that around the same time, there was another group of people that was trying to measure the, the spectrum. So this is Herb Gush in uh, Canada was trying to measure the spectrum tipped with uh, sounding rockets and they were working on it for quite a long time. It started around the same time as COBE was proposed. And their measurement isn't uh, as well known because it's less precise and came somewhat later. But they were only a few months after the COBE satellite uh, with their measurements and also provided an independent measurement of the, the CMB spectrum. And it's a much smaller experiment. As you can see, it's only three people. So they almost scooped the, the big uh, collaboration. <clears throat> so that's the, those are the two, two measurements we have of the, the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. And since then, this hasn't really been revisited. I'm, I think, I mean, in, in, in our lifetimes, there will eventually be another measurement of the spectrum, but so far there isn't. Uh, there were proposals, but they weren't funded, so we will see. Eventually, I think it happens again, because as we'll explain, there's interesting physics that you can actually learn by measuring the spectrum with higher precision than, uh, than has been measured. Okay, so now let's continue with the, the theoretical description and try to do a little bit better. So let's try to understand a little bit better how last scattering happens. Just to get an idea what a, a photon experiences or how the universe evolves during that period. So we'll discuss last scattering and as we'll see, to understand last scattering, we'll also have to understand how hydrogen recombines. And so the relevant process in this case, so if we're interested in last scattering, We'll estimate the other ones later on, but they're already frozen out. They're no longer efficient at the time of last scattering. So the only relevant process at this, during this period is Compton scattering. So you have uh, Compton scattering. And the, the rate for this process, uh, you probably know. So the rate, let's call it for, for Compton scattering, uh, per photon 
is the proportional to the number density of electrons, and then there's the, the Thomson cross-section and the speed of light, where the Thomson cross-section is uh, obviously proportional to alpha squared and inversely proportional to the mass of the electron squared, just to get the, the units correctly, and then there's an 8 pi over 3, and this, if you plug in the numbers, is 0.66 uh, barn. So this is the, uh, the rate for Compton scattering. And so last scattering occurs when this rate becomes comparable to the expansion rate of the universe. So if a given photon only scatters once or then eventually less than once on, a, on the time scale on which the, the universe expands, so we'll try to estimate when that happens. And for the, for the beginning, we'll estimate it, uh, try to estimate when this happened, would happen if the universe remained ionized the whole time. So this occurs when the rate becomes of order Hubble, and if the universe remained ionized, we would just have that the, uh, the scattering rate, which we said is equal to the number density of electrons times the Thom Thomson cross-section times the speed of light, this would be essentially the number density, which we know from uh, observations. So this would be the baryon number density times the Thomson cross-section times the speed of light. So this is not entirely true, because what we know is that it's equal to the number density of, of protons, uh, but I'm ignoring I'm ignoring helium, so there is a, a factor, one minus the helium mass fraction, which is 0.76, which I'm setting to one for now, because I'm anyway working at the level of twiddles. But so, at the level of twiddles, the, the scattering rate in an ionized universe is the number density of parents times the Thomson cross-section times the speed of light. And these various pieces, uh, we can all estimate. So the number density of baryons is proportional to omega b h squared, and then the number one can work out. I mean, the, the number density is the uh, energy density divided by the mass of the proton, and then the energy density is omega b times the, the critical energy density, so if you plug, which is 3 h0 squared over 8 pi g, so if you plug those all in, this is 10 to the minus 5 inverse cubic centimeters, so this is this piece, and then we also know that this redshifts like the third power of the scale factor, or since we saw that the temperature redshifts like the scale factor, we can also write it as T over T C and B to the third power. So this is the, the number density of, of baryons written in this way, times, and then we have 0 0.66 times 10 to the minus 24 centimeter squared, that's the Thomson cross-section, and then we have the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 10 centimeters per second, and let's just continue on this one. So if we continue here, this is omega b h squared, and then we have the 3 times 2 thirds is, is a 2, so we have a 2 times 10 to the minus uh, 29 times 10 is 10 to the minus 19, and then the centimeter is all canceled, so this is just hertz, which is good, and then it's t over t c and b cubed, and this is supposed to be, we should compare it to the expansion rate of the universe. So if you look at the expansion rate of the universe, uh, 
then uh, right now, I mean, a priori, we don't know if we should compare it to the expansion rate in the during matter domination or radiation domination, but uh, I'll just tell you that it's uh, the expansion rate during the uh, matter dominated era that's, that's relevant, omega matter h squared times, and then let's call it three times 10 to the minus 18 hertz. And so if you compare these, uh, you find, so this also goes like uh, the Hubble rate squared went like the scale factor to the minus three. So this goes like, we're taking the square root T C M B to the three halves. And so we find that T over T C M B, if we set them equal, T C M B, that last scattering in a fully ionized universe would occur around the time when T over T C M B to the third uh, three halves power is of order uh, square root omega matter H squared over omega B H squared. And then I'm dividing three times 10 to the minus 18 by two times 10 to the minus 19. This is 15 around roughly. So, um, and that's it, I think. Okay, and so if we plug in these numbers, so these again we know from, uh, from experiments, uh, this omega matter h squared is 1.14, so this is something like uh, 0.37, omega b h squared is around 0.02 times 15, so this whole thing is around 270, so if you take it to the two-thirds power, you find that T over T, C, and B, in this case, would be around 40, or that this would occur at a temperature of around, let's call it 100, 100 Kelvin or 120 Kelvin. And this is a temperature that's very low, so this is a temperature that's much below the uh, temperature associated with the, the binding energy of, of hydrogen, which is around, let's call it 10 to the 4 Kelvin. So we know that hydrogen will form long before this, uh, long before this happens. And so we'll have to understand how recombination works. And it turns out then that last scattering actually happens during recombination. So this is much below the one EV temperatures that are associated with hydrogen uh, recombination. And so last scattering occurs during recombination. And so we'll have to study uh, recombination if we want to understand how last scattering happens. And for any process in cosmology, I think it's a good strategy to always start with the equilibrium calculation, even if it doesn't give you the full answer. It's also true in this case, unfortunately, but it still gives you the, the right ballpark. So for recombination, the relevant uh, process, so what we're interested in is uh, at what point uh, we go from the ionized phase to the, to the neutral phase. And um, we know that in thermal equilibrium, the number density of, of any species, 
doesn't have to be any of these guys, but the number density of any species is equal to the uh, number of spin degrees of freedom times the mass times kt over 2 pi h bar squared to the 3 halves times e to the minus the chemical potential of that species over kt times e to the minus the rest mass of that species. So this is the, the number density of, of any species in, in thermal equilibrium. And the one problem, well, it's not really so much of a problem, but we, uh, the problem is that we don't know the chemical potentials in general, so we can't use it directly to figure out what the abundances of electrons, protons, and, and hydrogen are at any given, uh, uh, given temperature. So we don't know these chemical potentials, mu E, mu P, and the chemical potential for hydrogen 1S. But we know that as long as this uh, uh, reaction occurs rapidly, the chemical potentials have to obey mu E plus mu P is equal to mu, and let me just call it 1S and drop the H so I don't have to write the H all the time. And so this means that even though we can't compute the number density of any one of the species, we can compute ratios in which the, the chemical potential cancels. So we can, for example, compute, or not, I mean, can compute this ratio, the number density of uh, hydrogen divided by the number density of electrons, divided by the number density of protons, because then the chemical potentials cancel. And so if we look at our formulas, the, the spin degrees of freedom for hydrogen 1s is just four, two for the proton, two for the, uh, two for the electron. So we have four spin degrees of freedom. Then we have the mass of the 1s state divided by uh, times kT over two pi h bar squared to the 3 halves, then we have the chemical potential e to the minus mu 1s over kt, e to the minus m, the mass of the 1s state, over kt. And then in the denominator here, we have two spin states for the electron, two for the proton, so we have 2 times 2 is also 4. And then we have the mass of the electron times kT over 2 pi h bar squared to the 3 halves, then the mass of the proton kT divided by 2 pi h bar squared to the 3 halves. Then we have the two chemical potentials, let's uh, put them together, minus mu E plus mu P over kT, and then we have let me still squeeze it in here, uh, minus Me plus Mp over Kt. And so you see that by construction now, the, the chemical potential, this one cancels this one. Uh, this is what we, uh, why we're writing this, uh, this ratio. And then also, we'll keep the, the difference in the, or the binding energy in the exponential, but we're not keeping the binding energy in, the, in this part here, so we can neglect it here. Uh, and so the equation then simplifies and becomes uh, so the four cancels this thing, so we just get two pi h bar squared over uh, m e k t to the three halves. So that's this piece. And then here we have the ma e to the, and then the mass of the electron plus the proton minus the mass of the hydrogen. So this is e to the binding energy, the 
uh, electron volts for the hydrogen 1s state. And so this uh, thing now here on this side, everything is known. So this is the known as the Saha equation. And uh, we can massage it uh, a little bit still. So we can, uh, first of all, by charge neutrality, we know that the number density of electrons should be the same as the number density of the, the protons. And uh, we can simplify it by introducing the free electron fraction as giving us the number density of free electrons is the free electron fraction times the total number of electrons, and the uh, electrons are the free ones, plus the ones that are in the hydrogen, uh, tied up in hydrogen 1s. And then here, instead of the electrons, we can also put the, the protons. And so if we plug that in, um, we can write this as H1s divided by Xe squared times the number density of protons plus number density of H1s squared is equal to this thing, 2 pi H bar squared over Me kT to the 3 halves E to the B1s over kT. And then um, we can simplify it a little bit more. By eliminating the number density of H1s, we can also write that in terms of the free electron fraction because we know that 1 minus the free electron fraction is, so the free electron fraction is Ne, which is also Np. So this is 1 we can write as Np plus NH1s divided Np plus NH1s. And the free electron fraction we can write as minus Np over Np plus NH1s. And so these guys cancel. So this is just NH1s divided by NP plus NH1s. And so we see that this is what we have here. So we have this ratio of the number density of one, uh, one S, uh, hydrogen atoms in the 1s state over the total number of these guys. So what we have is that 1 minus Xe, the free electron fraction, divided by the square of the free electron fraction is equal to, and we can bring this to the other side, NP plus NH1s times 2 pi h bar squared over Me kT to the 3 halves e to the B1s over kT. And the last thing we can do is this is almost the number, uh, number density of, of baryons, but not quite because the number density of baryons is equal to the number density of protons plus the number density of H1s, but then there's also helium around, so there's four times the number density of uh, helium. And so uh, we also introduced at some point the helium mass fraction, which was four times the number density of helium divided by the number density of, of these guys, so divided by Nb. And so if we compute 1 minus the helium mass fraction, it's just this piece that cancels. So 1 minus the helium mass fraction is Np plus Nh1s 
over the number density of baryons. And so the quantity that we have here in this equation is the number density of baryons times one minus the helium mass fraction. This is what I was mentioning earlier when I was uh, dropping it. But for the Saha equation, uh, let's keep it and let's write this finally as So let's finally write this as the 1 minus xe over xe squared is equal to the number density of baryons, which is something we know. Uh, we used it earlier in our estimate, times 1 minus the helium mass fraction. This is another observable. So by now, everything that, that's on the right-hand side is an observable that we can plug in numbers for, which means we have a formula for the, for the helium mass fraction. And so uh, we can just plug in the various numbers and, and see what happens. And this is uh, the curve looks like this, so the prediction if you look at it, so the free electron fraction, if you had high temperatures, is one, so it's fully ionized. And then as you approach 4,000 Kelvin, uh, you start to, uh, to recombine. So that's the estimate that we get from our equilibrium calculation. So the onset of recombination uh, occurs around 4,000 Kelvin. And this is roughly correct. The rest of the curve isn't really entirely correct. So the uh, equilibrium calculation doesn't quite capture exactly how recombination happens because recombination doesn't uh, occur in thermal equilibrium for a number of, uh, for a number of reasons. So this is uh, because, on the one hand, any Lyman alpha photon, so the transition from the 2p to the 1s state that you might think takes you to the, to the ground state, uh, isn't very efficient because as soon as you emit, the, because the medium is optically thick, so as soon as one of the atoms goes to the 1s state that way, it reionizes one of the other ones. So this doesn't really uh, change the, the net uh, state of the system. So you can't really go to the ground state in the naive way you thought you could. The second thing related to this is if you have, uh, uh, if a proton captures an electron and the, uh, emits a photon in the process, that photon readily reionizes another hydrogen atom. So again, you don't change the net ionization state. 
and so there's no net n net change to the to the state of the system and so the way recombination actually happens is uh, through much slower processes where things don't get reabsorbed so the recombination actually happens predominantly through the uh, two photon transition much slower but then also these photons have energies that are too too small to do anything to another hydrogen atom so this is uh, an important uh, process and so all these uh, this has to be taken account when you're doing the the calculation which isn't really captured by the uh, equilibrium calculation and so these this calculation was first done uh, by, by Peebles, as I briefly mentioned uh, yesterday, for uh, essentially a three-level system of the, the hydrogen atom. So there's, this is from 1986, uh, 68, sorry. So there, there was the calculation by Peebles and then there's an independent uh, calculation by Zeldovich, Kurt, and Sunyaev. These are uh, with three level atoms, and this is what was used for a long time. Also, the codes, there's a code that's called the RecFast code, that's basically uh, built on, on these types of calculations. And then recently, with the measurements of the Planck satellite, the, the precision is so high that these calculations aren't accurate enough. So there's more recent calculations now that include many, many excited states of the hydrogen atom, hundreds of excited states. And those, I mean, the, the relevant codes, if you're interested in them, so there's, uh, in these calculations, this Cosmo Rec by Jens Chluba, and there's High Rec by Yasin Ali Haimoud. and Chris Hirata. And so, I mean, if, if you just look at a, a plot, you're not necessarily going to see the, the difference very easily. But for the, for the precision, for Planck, for unbiased measurements, with Planck, these are necessary. Well, and I mean, somewhat ironically, uh, Planck didn't really then use these codes, but adjusted the old code with fudge parameters to reproduce the, the results from, from these codes. But at least you need the, the precision that was achieved by, by these codes. And if you do that, uh, so this is just a discussion. The formulas don't look too compli uh, complicated when you go through the derivation. The derivation is longer. But if you look at the final result, it's not much different from the uh, not too much, not much more complicated than the result we wrote down, and still something that you can easily implement and make figures of. And you see that the recombination is significantly delayed by these processes. So the red curve here is what you get from this is the the Peebles uh, calculation, the formula I was showing you, uh, and you see that. The onset is captured correctly, it's around 4,000 Kelvin, but then it's just the way recombination happens is delayed because it's not really happening in equilibrium because you can't uh, drop to the 1S state from the 2P state in this medium. So this is what the, the curves look like. And then uh, something that's used a lot in the in various calculations, in various contexts, that comes up a lot, so let me introduce it here, is uh, 
the probability of last scattering, which is the thing that we were earlier approximating by a delta function, so now we can finally, with this, uh, we can work out what it really looks like and understand what we actually appro uh, approximated by a delta function. And so, okay, let's consider a single photon. So we have a photon, and then we have our gas of uh, free electrons here that it scatters off. Uh, I mean, obviously, at some level, they also scatter off the protons. The reason I'm always talking about the electrons is because, as you remember, the cross-section goes like 1 over the mass squared, so it's uh, much suppressed for the scattering off of the, of the protons. So the, let's say this is a t, t plus dt. So then the uh, probability to scatter during that time is just Ne sigma Thompson C times dt. And the change, so this is just the probability to scatter between t and t plus dt. And then the uh, change in the number density number or number density of let's call them unscattered photons in this interv interval is just dn gamma is minus that thing times the number of uh, photons we had around times c times dt. And so if we're trying to, uh, we can integrate that equation to find out what n gamma as a function of t is, and it's n gamma at t0 which is the number of uh, photons that wasn't scattered at the initial time. Uh, this is then the number of photons that isn't scattered at the final time. And we can just take the ratio to compute the probability uh, that a photon didn't scatter between T and T0. is then just given by that ratio. So it's p of t and t0 is just e to the minus integral of t to t0 and e Thompson cross-section times c times dt. And so from this, it's now also easy to compute the probability that a photon last scattered between t and t plus dt, because if you're interested in that, so let's say we, we're interested in, so t0 is the present time. Here, let's say, is t. Here is t plus dt. So we have t, t plus dt. What we can calculate with this thing is the probability that it didn't scatter here. This is p of t plus dt and t0. And we can also compute the probability that it didn't scatter here. But the probability that it last scattered here is just the probability that it didn't scatter here minus the probability that it didn't scatter here. So the uh, probability for last scattering between t and t plus dt is equal to p of t plus dt comma t0 minus p of t and t0. 
and so if we look at that formula, Uh, if we look at that formula, then um, we just take the, the derivative. So this is just the derivative with respect to t of that thing. So p of t is equal to d by dt of that thing, which just brings down ne sigma t times c times e to the minus integral from t to t0 ne sigma t c dt. So this is the, the probability of last scattering is just given in, in, this, in this form. So in the uh, number density of electrons we know this is just set by the free electron density times 1 minus the helium mass fraction times the baryon density and these things we know. So once you have that curve you can also right away calculate the, the probability of, of last scattering. And this is uh, so it looks like this, peaks around uh, 3,000 Kelvin and is relatively narrow. And so this is the thing that earlier when we were saying that in, uh, last scattering happens instantaneously that we were approximating by, uh, by a delta function. So this is if you want to do better, then you can keep track of this probability of, of last scattering. So here I was writing it as a function of temperature, here it's written as a function, uh, a function of time, here it's written as a function of temperature, but you can convert between uh, temperature and, and time from, from what we did before. Okay, so this is this part. And then um, now we'll try to take a closer look at the, uh, at the spectrum. So we'll take a closer look at uh, the spectrum. and spectral distortions. So there's still a number of things that we have to, to estimate to get a better feeling for the, the various processes that are going on here. And uh, what we'll need, so a number of these things uh, occur during radiation domination. So we'll have to figure out, uh, this is something that we can calculate from the, from the measurement from the, the COBE satellite. So first, as a preliminary to figuring out the spectrum and spectral distortions, let us figure out what's the, the energy density So we can get these from Kobe's measurement, which says that the CMB temperature is 2.7255 Kelvin. So there's a number of uh, interesting things we can do with that number. One of them is mostly just amusing and out of uh, curiosity, something that one might ask, is you could ask, well, how, ma how many CMB photons are there per cubic centimeter, so you can just compute the number density of, of photons. So let's do that before we do this. So if you wanted to compute the number density of photons, this is just the integral over the spectrum, so it's just the integral from zero to infinity of uh, eight pi nu squared d nu over e to the h nu over k t, and then this is the CMB temperature as measured by Kobe minus one. If you plug in the, the numbers, then you find that this is 410 per cubic centimeter. So in every uh, cubic centimeter, also in this room, there's 410 CMB photons. So it's quite a lot of them. 
they're low energetic, so we don't notice a whole lot of it, but it's, there's a lot of them around. Um, the energy density works in the same way with a new cubed, but what we're usually interested in is the energy density in radiation, and so here I'll just tell you, I haven't derived that, but I'll just tell you that the energy density in radiation is the energy density in the photons times one, just because there's photons around, but then there's also neutrinos around. There's three, uh, three uh, families of neutrinos around. Then there's a factor of seven-eighths uh, because the neutrinos are fermions rather than bosons. And then uh, the neutrinos, it turns out, are a little bit cooler than the, the photons because the neutrinos decouple from the standard model uh, just before or around the time electrons and positrons annihilate. And so when the electrons and positrons annihilate, they reheat the photons, but they don't reheat the neutrinos. And so there's a, a factor of 4 11th to the 4 thirds. And so the, once you know the energy density in the photons, you also know the energy density in the, in the neutrinos. And we can measure, once we know the energy density in the photons, which we can get from here, we can also figure out what the energy density is of the radiation that's around, so photons and neutrinos. And usually the way we're writing it is as the, the way we did it before, is we were always saying that this is omega radiation times the critical uh, energy density, so we can write it like this. And then the critical energy density, we also said, is 3H0 squared over 8 pi g. By now, the Hubble parameter is reasonably well known, but usually this is written as uh, omega radiation H squared, just to absorb our lack of knowledge of H0. So uh, little h is H0 divided by uh, 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So these are the funny units for the, the Hubble parameter. So it's omega radiation H squared. And then three, and let me call this thing H100 over 8 pi g. So this is just some number. And we can calculate this number, and then with this number, the entire number. So this translates for this parameter, which is the parameter that often comes up, as 4.15 times 10 to the minus 5. So this is the, the energy density for the, for the radiation in the universe. And once we know that number, we can also easily estimate when uh, in the history of the universe is energy. It's the energy density of the universe dominated by matter, and when is it dominated by uh, radiation. So we can, from this, we can estimate matter radiation equality. When is the energy density? in matter the same as that in the energy density. So here, remember that h squared was equal to h0 squared, the present Hubble parameter squared, times omega matter times 1 plus z cubed, or before we wrote as a0 over a cubed, which is the same thing, plus omega radiation times, oops, 1 plus z to the fourth. And then usually you might just put uh, omega lambda here. For now, let's be more general and put omega dark energy times 1 plus z to the 3 times 1 plus w. Uh, but we're actually not using it because right now we're just trying to compare the energy densities in the, the matter and the radiation. So ma matter radiation equality happens when these two things are equal or, so when we're setting them equal, this is just at 1 plus z is equal to omega matter 
over omega radiation, which is the same as omega matter h squared over omega radiation h squared. And then here, this one, we said from the data, we know this is around 0.14. And this is the thing that I just told you. If you plug in the various numbers here, you find 4.15 times 10 to the minus 5. So this is around 3,000. And so matter radiation equality occurs around a redshift of 3,000. Uh, one can do it more precisely, but that's just the, the ballpark number. And then in terms of the, the temperature, it's around 10,000 Kelvin. You saw that recombination happens around 3,000 Kelvin. So recombination happens in the, the matter-dominated uh, period, not by much, but it happens in the matter-dominated period. And so now when we'll discuss the, the origin of the, the spectrum, when uh, photons no longer efficiently exchange uh, energies with photons, and when photons are no longer efficiently produced or destroyed, we'll mostly be working in the radiation-dominated era. So this will be at, at higher redshifts. So that's why I wanted to just make sure we know uh, around what time, around what redshift matter radiation equality happens. OK, and so now uh, with this uh, knowledge, so the energy density in the photons, and when matter radiation equality happens, we can work out uh, a number of different um, things that are relevant to understand the, the spectrum of the CMB better, which is what we'll try to do now. Does that all make sense? Okay. Okay, so as we said earlier, to set up a black body spectrum, we have to have processes that really change the, the energy of photons appreciably. Let's make bullet points because there's a number of things. So and we need processes that rapidly change the number of photons. So processes that rapidly change the number of photons. And um, you might think that you're efficiently or rapidly changing the energies of photons as long as the photons are rapidly scattering with the, with the electrons. But that doesn't turn out to be uh, quite true. So let's see uh, how that works. So if you look at the, the scattering, so this is, again, here we're looking at uh, Compton scattering, so electron uh, scattering between electrons and photons. And then the photons, we know from their distribution, so they have the typical energies and momenta are of order the temperature. And so if a photon scatters, the momentum changes by uh, amounts of order t. So the momentum transfer in these scattering processes is also of order t. But then uh, this means that the energy of an electron in this process <coughs> 
let's say it was at rest before, so let's say you put the electron at rest, you hit it with a photon, then the energy after this is just the kinetic energy, which is the momentum squared, so kT squared over Me, kT squared over Me, so this is, let's call it delta E, or the kinetic energy in the, in the electron, and this is smaller than the temperature by this factor of kT over Me. This is, of course, much less than one, so you're changing the energies of the electrons and hence by energy conservation also of the photons by an amount that's much smaller than kT. So even though the momenta rapidly change, the energies of the photons don't change. So we need of order Me over kT scattering events to change the energy of a photon by, uh, of order the temperature, and so also the rate at which the, the energies of the photons changes, or the rate at which en uh, photons and electrons efficiently exchange energy is smaller than the scattering rate by, by this factor, by this kT over Me, and so uh, the photons, long before they last scatter, cease to efficiently exchange energy with the, uh, with the electrons. So the rate, let's call it gamma kT, is equal to the rate for Compton scattering times this factor, kT over Me times gamma Compton scattering, and we can write it as um, kT CMB over Me, and then really here I'm always, I mean C is sometimes one, sometimes it isn't, so here let me just put it explicitly back, times T over T CMB times, and then the Compton scattering rate was just Ne sigma Thompson, uh, Thompson cross-section times, uh, times C, and so we estimated uh, the, this part before, so we can do that part again. So this is omega b h squared times 10 to the minus 5 inverse centimeters cubed, and now we have t over t c and b to the fourth power that's from this piece, then we have 0 0.66 times 10 to the minus 24 times 3 times 10 to the 10. Uh, this is centimeters squared, centimeters cubed per second, so this is just hertz. And then here, let me just squeeze that thing in here, so this is kT CMB over Me C squared. So this again was the 2 times 10 to the 19, so we have omega B H squared times 2 times 10 to the minus 19 uh, from these things, and then we have this factor. So the CMB temperature is about a hundredth of a room temperature, so it's 1 over 4,000. So the room temp temperature is a 40th of an electron volt, so we have 1 over uh, 4,000 of an electron volt, and then the electrons have 511 times 10 to the 3 uh, keV, uh, so this is the in eV, so we get, uh, this is 10 to the 2, let's call this 5, and then 10 to the 5, so we have this whole thing is 2 times 10 to the 9, and then it's T over T C and B, 
So the fourth power in this whole thing is in hertz. So there's an additional suppression by a factor of 2 times 10 to the 9 from the kt cmb over mec squared. And so now we're asking when this is equal to the, to the expansion rate of the universe. And this happens much earlier. So this is much less efficient than Compton scattering. So this happens earlier and happens in the radiation dominated era. So here we should compare this to the expansion rate that's equal to uh, square root of omega radiation h squared times the 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec, which is something like 3 times 10 to the minus 18 hertz. And then uh, the energy density scales, like the scale factor to the fourth power, here we're taking the square root to get the Hubble rate. So this is T over T CMB squared. And so if we're trying to equate those two things, we can figure out at what redshift this happens or at what temperature. So if we set them equal, we get that T over T C M B squared is equal to, and then I'm keeping this piece here, omega radiation H squared divided by omega baryon H squared. And then we have this piece, uh, 3 times 10 to the minus 18 divided by this is what we were calling 15 earlier, we're dividing by this, so there's a 2 times uh, 10 to the 9. So this is 3 times 10 to the 10. Uh, hopefully I got all the, the factors. And then uh, omega radiation H squared, as we said, is 4, well, I erased it, but it's 4.15 times 10 to the minus 5. We can take the square root is 6 times 10 to the minus 3. Uh, this one here, uh, so this is 6 times 10 to the minus 3, roughly over 0 0.02. So this is 2 times 10 to the minus 3. So this is 0 0.3 times 3 is roughly 1. So all in all, this is about 10 to the 10. And so you see that uh, photons only exchange energies efficiently with electrons at redshifts of above 10, uh, 10 to the 5. So photons At, uh, at redshifts above 10 to the 5. And so in particular, as we were saying earlier, during last scattering, the, the energy of the photons doesn't uh, really change anymore. The spectrum is already frozen in, so it doesn't matter if it happens um, instantaneously or it doesn't. So we have to figure out what the spectrum looked like at, at those uh, temperatures. And then the other thing we have to understand is at what uh, energies or, or redshifts, what temperatures did, uh, can you create and destroy photons? So that's the other, the other question. So the other question to understand what the spectrum looks like, so I'll, I'll put it all together at the end, but for now let's do that uh, additional estimate up to, similar to this estimate, up to what uh, redshift or above what redshift do you rapidly create and destroy photons? And here, what we can estimate is, let's look at double Compton scattering. This is basically the same calculation for, for both of them. But let's, uh, let's look at double Compton scattering. Uh, 
and we'll try to do the same estimate as we did here. So the question is, when is the rate for double Compton scattering comparable to the, to the expansion rate of the universe? So for that, what we need is, let's draw the diagram in this way. Um, and then uh, there's, let's say you're emitting an additional photon here. So this is our, uh, our process. And then the claim is, and I'll show it in a second. So the claim is that the rate for, let's call it double Compton scattering is approximately, so obviously there's an additional power of alpha. So I'm, I'm writing it relative to the rate for Compton scattering. Relative to Compton scattering, there's an additional power alpha just because you're emitting an additional photon. And then there's uh, an additional piece, which is KT over ME squared that's the claim. That's not yet obvious from, from what I'm drawing here. I'll, I'll show you in a second how you, how you find this. KT over ME squared, and then the rate for Compton scattering, which is the, the rate that we were always writing down. So ME sigma T times C. And usually it's the free electron rate, but here we're at such high temperatures that it's fully ionized. So I'm just calling it uh, this again. So I'm dropping the XE. And so the one thing... So we're then trying to equate this to the Hubble rate. And um, let's see where the KT over ME squared comes from. So schematically, you can also think of this as the change in the velocity. And you knew that something like that had to be there because you only really get, up, uh, get anything if this thing is accelerating. So there has to be some delta V for it to actually emit a photon. Otherwise, if it's just moving at a constant velocity, nothing happens. So this is the delta V squared. And the, the way you can see it is uh, from what are called, so this is a practical application, if you wish, of soft photon theorems. So a soft photon theorem tells you, given a hard scattering process, let's say, in this case, Compton scattering, what is the scattering amplitude for, if, for emitting an additional soft photon in that process? So we can compute the scattering amplitude for E minus gamma goes to E minus gamma and then gamma prime according to the uh, soft photon theorem, so in the limit where this momentum is much smaller than the other ones, but I mean, it's m smaller than the uh, mass of the electron by, by quite a bit. We saw er earlier that we have this factor two to the nine. And so what you get is uh, it, uh, a contribution for each of the lines it can attach to. It can come from this line or it can come from this line. And so the it's only the external ones that actually contribute to the soft photon theorems. So there's the uh, momentum one, if it attaches to the first line, times the polarization vector of the, the photon, divided by P1 dot Q, there's the plus I epsilons, but let's ignore those. Then there's minus for the other leg, P2 dot epsilon over P2 dot Q times the amplitude for Compton scattering. So this is, I don't have space, but let me just write E, min e minus gamma goes to E minus gamma. So this is just the, the underlying hard process. So the process without this additional gamma. And so then um, in the limit we're working, we're in the non-relativistic limit. So the zeroth component here is just the mass, so we just have E times M uh, epsilon zero um, plus, well, minus P one dot epsilon minus, uh, well, it's P one dot Q. Then I should have maybe started a little bit further over so I have more space, so let me just write it again. So it's E and then m epsilon zero minus p dot epsilon divided by, um, well, it's just m times, let's call the, the frequency omega, minus e m 
epsilon naught minus P2, this was P1, P2 dot epsilon divided by, and again here, this is essentially in the non-relativistic limit, M times the, the frequency of that photon times the, the hard amplitude. And then you see that this piece cancels. So these pieces cancel. And if you're combining them, you just get that this is E times P2 minus P1. Or let's call that thing, well, it doesn't matter. Um, let's call, so P2 minus P1 dot epsilon. So that's these pieces divided by the mass. And let's call this Q times the original amplitude. And you see that the, this is delta P over M. So this is delta V, essentially, this whole thing. So this is E times delta V, the change in the momentum of your, of your line um, dot epsilon over Q times M. Let me keep this estimate maybe. And so then if you write the cross section for double Compton scattering, you're integrating. So there's the Lorentz invariant uh, phase space integral, 2 pi cubed 2q. And then we're squaring this thing, which gives an alpha delta v squared after we're doing the sums over the, the polarizations. This just gives us the, the metric. So it just gives delta v squared over q squared times the original thing. And so uh, this essentially just goes out. And this is something like, so we see the additional factor of alpha, which had to be there. Then there is the delta v squared, which just tells you that you're only getting emission if the, the line is accelerated. And then uh, this is the original uh, Thompson cross-section times some order one uh, log here. Okay, so that's the explanation for, for this formula. If that wasn't too valuable for you, then maybe just remember that there's this uh, delta v squared. And so with this now, uh, we can estimate when this rate becomes equal to the, to the expansion rate of the universe. And so we do the, the same, same calculation. So there's just another. So we calculated. Maybe we can take a shortcut because I have that formula. So we have another power of this. So that gives me, so we get omega double Compton scattering. The only additional piece is the alpha. So there's a 10 to the minus 2 relative to the other formula. And then here, I get another power of T over T CMB. So this will be to the fifth power. And then I get an additional K T CMB over ME, which was uh, 1 over 2 times 10 to the 9. So I get 1 over 4 times 10 to the 18 instead of that thing. Then I still have omega B H squared times 2 times 10 to the minus 19. And I have T over T C and B to the fifth power, uh, and then in hertz, hopefully. So omega B H squared times 10 to the minus 19. Then I have the second piece of that one, the 10 to the minus 2. So that should be OK. And then the Hubble rate is the same thing it was before. This is still square root omega radiation h squared times um, 3 times 10 to the minus 18 hertz t over t c and b squared. And so if we set them equal, we get, so these are equal, 
if T over T C and B cubed is equal to square root omega radiation H squared over omega baryon H squared. And then here, uh, let's see. So we're multiplying, we're dividing by this. So there is 4 times 10 to the 18. This thing was 15 times 100. So there's 10 to the 20 times 15. So let's call this one. This one was 0.3. So let's call this thing 1, and let's call this whole thing 10 to the 21. And then uh, if we take the third root, we find that T over T, C, and B, when uh, processes uh, in which photons are created and destroyed, freeze out, is around 10 to the 7. So only above a redshift of about 10 to the 7 are processes like double Compton scattering and branch strahlung efficient and can rapidly change the number of uh, photons. Below redshift of 10 to the 7, the number of photons in the universe is actually conserved as far as this goes. And so let's uh, summarize this just in a little little diagram what we've learned okay so we started at 10 to the 9 Kelvin but we could have started at, at higher uh, temperatures at all these high temperatures processes in which uh, photons are created and destroyed uh, are very efficient and only above uh, around a, a redshift of 10 to the 7, uh, photons are no longer efficiently uh, created and destroyed. So let's call it Z of 10 to the 7. So at higher redshifts, photons are efficiently created and destroyed. Energies are rapidly uh, redistributed. So here is the, the period where no matter what you do, you will rapidly reestablish a black body spectrum for the cosmic microwave background photons. So up here, this is the, the era when you establish the black body spectrum. Then if you uh, remember, we calculated when photons and electrons efficiently exchange energies. This is happening at energies above or redshifts above about 10 to the 5. And if you, ex if you no longer uh, necessarily at the same time uh, rapidly create and destroy photons, then there could be a chemical potential for photons. So if in this period of time you inject energy or, or photons, you will uh, create a distribution with a chemical potential Uh, and so this era then is often referred to as the, the mu era, just because in this era, if you do anything to the, to the uh, cosmic microwave background, so let's say you have particles that decay or annihilate or some process that injects energy in, uh, during this period, you create a chemical potential because you can no longer readjust the number of the photons and then uh, something that doesn't matter too much for the spectrum, but eventually there's uh, last scattering. So there's at a redshift of 10 to the 3, there's last scattering. And then we observe everything at uh, redshift of 0. And below here, uh, you're neither uh, able to readjust the number of photons or really redistribute the, the energies efficiently. So whatever you do here, you're kind of uh, stuck with it. The, the spectrum doesn't really get necessarily reprocessed a whole lot. And so this is often called the, the Y era. And then sometimes here there's I or intermediate era, but this is just because there's some uh, intermediate shapes between the, this particular shape. So this is a spectral distortion and in form of these are called mu distortions if the spectrum looks like this.
And then in the y error, there's a specific shape that I don't really have time to derive, but in principle, you start from the Companies equation and you find there's a, a well-defined shape uh, here for uh, how you compute the, the spectral distortions. And so you see there's a number of uh, events when you actually do inject. So we were initially we were assuming that we're not injecting any additional photons or energy into the medium, but that isn't really entirely true because, for example, around the time of recombination, you know that when the, the hydrogen forms, you emit, uh, in every, every time you form a hydrogen atom, you emit some, some photons, and they're not obeying any of the, they're not obeying a black body spectrum. They're just line emission from, from the atoms. So this is something that causes spectral distortions. These are called the recombination lines. Uh, we were discussing hydrogen. Helium also recombines, so also during helium recombination, you emit uh, photons, and in principle, also those distort the CMB spectrum, and it's something you can try to look for. And then at late times, the universe becomes reionized, so the first stars form, and you have hot electrons around. These hot electrons eventually scatter with the CMB photons and reheat them, but you no longer have any way of redistributing the energies or the, the number density of, of photons, so you're distorting the CMB spectrum at, at late times from, from reionization. So these give you these uh, Y distortions. And I'll, I'll just show you the, uh, the, the relevant plots and what they, uh, what they look like. So this is what the recombination lines look like. So this is the change to the uh, photon spectrum from recombination lines. So you see the different uh, line, uh, lines from, from hydrogen and from, uh, from helium. So helium is, is further down here. But in principle, if you can measure the spectral distortions of the cosmic microwave background well enough and you can extract the, the helium abundance and you can get a completely independent measurement of the, the helium abundance and really primordial, doesn't have anything to do with astrophysics or how these things are usually measured. So these are the spectral distortions from uh, from recombination. And then the reason they're so small is not that the process is inefficient, so you're emitting one of these photons per, high, uh, per atom you're forming. The problem is just that you have so many more photons than you have atoms. So the, the ratio or the reason this is suppressed by a factor of 10 to the 9 or so is just that you only have one atom per 10 to the 9 uh, photons. So that's the recombination lines. And then here there's a lot in the, in the plot, but the, the ones I was discussing, these are again the recombination lines as a, as a guide. And then the other eff uh, effect that I was discussing is from reionization. So when the first stars form, reionize the universe, you have hot electrons around that the CMB can interact with. Then you get the distortions that are shown here. And the thin line here means it's actually negative. So you're depleting the, the spectrum at lower uh, frequencies and you get an increase at higher frequencies. That maybe makes sense if you're trying to, if you're injecting energy, you have to move your spectrum to the right. So if you have a spectrum like this, you're trying to increase the energy, you have to somehow just move it to the right so the, 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 the shape looks somewhat like this. So you have a deficit here and you have an increase here. That's what you're seeing for reionization and structure formation. And then um, the other effect that I haven't yet mentioned, but in the uh, early universe, when we look at the perturbations in the plasma on small scales, there's diffusion, and that injects energy into the, into the medium. And that shows up here. This is what's referred to as the, the silk damping. Uh, and this is, this is another uh, distortion to the CMB spectrum. And this is, well, this is a somewhat extreme model. This is what it would look like in the standard model. Here are some sensitivities for uh, proposed experiments. But so in principle, you can measure some of these things. And this also tests a lot of uh, models, let's say, beyond the standard model physics, if you have any decaying particles, or annihilating particles, so anything that changes the uh, uh, photons or the energy uh, or the energy of the plasma below redshift of 10 to the 7, then it's something that you could see in the, in the spectral distortions. And just for comparison, this is the scale of the black body spectrum. And you see that here the, the plot ends at 10 to the minus 23. 
somewhat intentionally. Uh, and here it starts at 10 to the minus 23. So you see that these are much smaller. I mean, these are small distortions. And right now, the best constraints we have are from, from Kobe. So to see anything, so Kobe hasn't seen anything. So to see something, you really would need a new experiment. Also, a proposal that uh, wasn't funded, but I, I think eventually, uh, sometime in our lifetime, we'll see another measurement of the cosmic uh, microwave background. Uh, spectrum and will constrain physics that's happening during this period, like the recombination lines, like decaying uh, dark matter, and, and so on. So that's that's what I wanted to say about the spectrum. Any any questions about the spectrum? Yeah. So this is uh, the. Oops. So here there are some of these uh, uh, some of these numbers. So you can see. Uh, some of these things, so you can see, for example, the spectral distortions from reionization, but you don't necessarily see the recombination lines. So it's about four orders of magnitude better than the current measurements. And it's basically the same, same instrument, just with new, I mean, uh, n yeah, uh, just redone. It's done also by the same people. Well, the proposal was by the same people. So they basically would be flying FIRAS, a new version of FIRAS again, basically. So in that sense, you also know that it should work. I mean, there's, <laughs> it worked before, so <laughs> the risk is pretty small. But <laughs> Any other questions? All right, if not, then in the next lecture, we'll discuss the, the dipole and the anisotropies.